In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This Sunday, we shall consider the remaining fruits of the Holy Ghost, modesty, continency, and chastity, focusing in particular on modesty. I was out walking the other day, and just a few blocks away from here, I saw some grade schoolers running around, and one of them was a little Muslim girl who was dressed in her feminine Muslim attire, dressed all the way down to her ankles, all the way up to her sleeves. She was even wearing a veil. And she was running around laughing and playing like the little girl she is. Consider, though, that the attire of this Muslim girl, who has no divine life in her, no indwelling of the Holy Trinity to veil, in comparison with that of the modern American woman, whose clothes are often so tight that they color the body more than cover it, or so exposing as to be relatively pointless. It's a common complaint, lack of decency and modesty, in our society today. Of course, it's getting worse. But it has not always been this way. It used to be everywhere that there were men and women across all cultures Men and women wore distinctive clothing, clothing both modest and appropriate to their sex. For hundreds and hundreds of years, since the beginning, in all countries, good Catholic women wore long flowing skirts and dresses. It has not been always as things are now. In fact, it has never been like this. A comparison with the Mass is most apt. The myth is that the Novus Ordo is the ordinary form of the Mass, when the reality of history tells us a far different story. It is the Novus Ordo that by its own admission is out of the ordinary, is a new thing, a new order, and so it gets to be judged by its own fruits. Sometimes people tell us that they don't like the Latin Mass because they can't understand it. They don't think that it's practical. But Christians had no problem understanding it for hundreds of years. Rich and poor alike, the literate and the Ill illiterate, could not understand Latin, let alone read their own language. Still became saints. Just so, there are some today who say that Dressing in modest women's attire is impractical for the woman. Well, again, it sure didn't seem to slow down all those good Christians who lived and worked in far harder times than we live and work in, without washing machines, air conditioners, cars, and so on. Somehow, these women managed to raise large families in smaller houses with less income. They managed gardening in the summer, traveling in the rain and the snow, ice skating, all wearing modest clothing appropriate to their gender. The rationalist thinks that clothing is for practicality alone, but we know better. Clothing is for modesty. The rationalists also misunder the mass, misunderstand the mass. They complain that repetitions in the ritual weren't practical, that you only need to say something once, and then you're done, and then we get on with it. But the ritual, the repetitions, everything involved in the Mass forms us. So do our clothes, so do our attire, the way we act. They shape who we are because the fruit of modesty, modesty is tied to self-control and chastity. Martian, Mar uh, modesty is called the guardian of purity. When the guardian is gone, so is what it guards. And both are all but gone from today's society. It might surprise you to learn, though, that this is all really part of a wicked plot. Plot of the devil, but one carried out by his servants, the Freemasons. Listen to their own words, written in 1928. Religion, and this is their own words, religion, they say, does not fear the dagger's point, 
but it can vanquish under corruption. Let us not grow tired of corruption. We may use such a pretext, a pretext as sport, hygiene, or health resorts. It is necessary to corrupt that our boys and girls practice nudism in dress. To avoid too much reaction, one would have to progress in a methodical manner. First, undress up to the elbow, then up to the knees, then the arms and legs completely uncovered, later the upper part of the chest, the shoulders, etc., etc. Thus far, the wicked masons. Our Blessed Mother warned little Jacinta a decade before, in 1917, that certain fashions will be introduced which will offend our Lord very much. Persons who serve God must not follow the fashions. Our Blessed Mother Mary knew that the 1920s would bring with it so-called fashion designers, designers they were, who would try to fulfill that Masonic plot. And we must admit, how well have they succeeded. We should also call to mind that time frame. How bad were the fashions in the 20s, 30s, and the 50s? When we look back at that, we say, oh, those are so immodest. We have immodest those people. I can't believe they're wearing that. Horrible. No, usually we don't. Because as immodest as they were in reality, they are tame by our immodest standards. To drive the message home, listen to what the great pastors of that era taught the church. Again, this is the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. 1921, Pope Benedict XV said that we know that certain modes of dress which women are beginning to accept are harmful to society, for they are the cause of evil. Yet those who spread this poison seem to ignore its evil effects. Only such an ignorance can explain the deplorable popularity of fashions so contrary to that sense of modesty, which should be the most beautiful adornment of the Christian woman. 1921. Again, in 1930, Pope Pius XI condemned emphatically the modest fashion of dress adopted by Catholic women and girls. And he mandated precisely that the parish priest should insist, argue, exhort, and command that feminine garb be based on modesty and womanly adornment a defense of virtue. Let them likewise, he says, admonish parents to cause their daughters to cease wearing indecorous dress. So if you think, I'm doing this just for myself, you are wrong. Later, in the, in the 40s and the 50s, Pius XII, more than anyone before him, spoke out again and again about the increase of immodesty. Here are just two short samples. To read everything that he writ, wrote and said would take far too long, at least for today. To say that modesty is a matter of custom, he says, is just as wrong as to say that honesty is a matter of custom. As long as modesty will not be put into practice, the society will continue to degrade. Society reveals what it is by the clothes it wears. What then, we are right to ask, do our shepherds give us as a guideline for modest attire for women? Clearly, you cannot use today's standards as any kind of guide. So to halt the devil's plan, Pope Pius XI provided instructions through his cardinal vicar in 1928. He says, A dress cannot be called decent, which is cut deeper than two fingers under the pit of the throat, which does not cover the arms at least to the elbows, and scarcely reaches a bit beyond the knees. Now, later, concessions were made from its sleeves shorter than the elbows, but that is it. Now, I know this is a hard saying. 
For many, this means that most of your dresses more than likely are actually immodest and cannot be worn. Not without sin, at least. Now, they may not, of course, be as immodest as the rampant immodesty of our times, but once again, we cannot in any way use our current society as any kind of standard for how to dress. To do so would be insanity, for it has no standards of decency. We must once again, like with everything else, look back to a time when women knew how to dress with feminine modesty, listen to the church's instructions and those of the saints and then put them into action. Parents, ensuring that your children are modestly attired in all situations is a grave obligation for you, which includes swimming, participating in sporting events, Listen to one of the many times that St. John Vianney inveighed against immodesty. He says, How many mothers are the cause of evil glances, of bad thoughts, of immodest touches? Tell me, are these the Christian mothers who she be so reserved? Oh, dear God, what judgment should they expect? Others are so cruel that they let their children run around the whole morning, during the summer, only half-dressed. Tell me, unhappy people, would it not be better for you to take your places among the savage beasts? Where is your religion, then, and your anxiety to do your duty? Alas, as far as religion is concerned, you have none. As for your duties, have you ever known what they were? That you have not, you give proof every day. Ah, poor children, how unfortunate you are to belong to such parents. Thus far, St. John Vianney. To the men, fathers and husbands, and all men, have a duty, firstly, to guard themselves, to cast no immodest glances upon any woman, as difficult as that may be, even what they're wearing, but above all, it means never to seek out anything immodest. No immodest images. For once you do this, you have joined the side of the devil, little better than a mason yourself. Furthermore, as the heads of your households, you have a responsibility to purge your house of immodest attire. But our restoration of a true and healthy and holy Catholic culture must be positive as well. We must cultivate an appreciation for feminine modesty. And so I very much recommend that you read and buy this book. Probably buy it first and then read it. Well, I guess we have libraries. It's called Dressing with Dignity by a Colleen Hammond. It's, once again, short and easy to read. It's around 100 pages. You can find it online. And soon, starting on Tuesday, if you come by the church, you can get a copy here for $5. I have about 30 of them coming. So come to Daily Mass. Pick up a copy. Read it. She's got a great style of writing. She keeps it short and fun and approachable, but also very factual. She gives you a lot more information than I'm able to give here. The veil girls in the back of the church, when you leave, will give you a little handout that has some of the quotes, some nice quotes from here, just to whet your appetite. So you see why, oh, yeah, this is neat. I should look at that. So to continue, there's more to modesty than just covering up. Modest attire reveals as much as it conceals. It reveals the person. Immodest attire is designed to expose the body, not the personality. Modest attire points to the face. It points to the person. And we know, because gender is binary, that a person is either a man or a woman. Which means, for attire to be truly modest, it must reveal a person to be a man or a woman. Before we go further, 
stop a moment and ask yourself, would you not describe our time as one of great gender confusion? What is confusion but when two things that are different are mixed up together? Feminism has confused men and women. It has told women that to be of any worth, they must look and act like men. It has put women into direct competition with men. Where there is gender confusion in your society, you will find high rates of divorce, high rates of homosexuality, effeminate men, and masculine women. Finally, you will find the culmination of gender confusion, transgenderism. We cannot doubt this. Women, ask yourself this question. Do you want a husband who is confused about his gender? Do you want a husband who is attracted to men? Or who is attracted to people with masculine attributes who dress like men? Do you not want him to be attracted to your femininity instead. And if you want that, you dress and act in a feminine way. Until only the last few decades, women everywhere have never worn pants. This is not to say that men in every culture have worn pants, but it is in the Bible for men. Women never have. Pants are an article of clothing that express particularly male qualities. Thus, whenever women wear pants, they become more masculine. Remember, we must not use habits derived from our culture as any sort of reasonable guide. The fact that so many women wear pants and have done so for decades, not centuries, decades, does not change anything. Just as predicted, the negative effects are now bearing their evil fruit. It is not good for men to dress like women. Neither is it good for women to dress like men. In fact, we have this on divine authority. Read Deuteronomy 22.5. A woman shall not be clothed in man's apparel. Neither shall a man use woman's apparel. For he that does these things is abominable before God. Once again, a hard saying. I do want to be clear here, though. I'm not saying that it is automatically sinful for women ever to wear pants of any kind. But you would do very well to reconsider this practice, its origins, and its fruit. When you look around, and you see what the past 50 years has done to our culture, that we live in a stew of gender confusion. What we need is gender clarity, specific attire, manners, and attitudes. Again, we need men to look and act like men, women to look and act like women. How offensive is it when a priest doesn't wear his clerical attire. How offensive is it when a religious sister who has pledged her life to God does not wear her habit? And what an effect on society that has. You see it. You feel it. It is corrosive. It's no different for you. Cardinal Siri predicted all of this not all of it. He didn't predict how bad it would be. He, he undershot how bad it would be. But he predicted the negative effects of women wearing pants back in 1960. He said that while pants seem to be modest, in that they cover the body, and certainly cover more of the body than a lot of immodest skirts, they change the very psychology of the woman. He writes, The mode of impelling women to wear men's dress is always that of imitating, nay, of competing with 
the man who is considered stronger, less tied down, more independent. This motivation shows clearly that male dress is the visible aid to bringing about a mental attitude of being like a man. Remember that wicked woman who boasted that she was a man by day. Secondly, ever since men have been men, he says, the clothing a person wears demands, imposes, and modifies that person's gestures, attitudes, and behavior, such that from merely being worn outside, clothing comes to impose a particular frame of mind inside. Women wearing men's dress always more or less indicates her reacting to her own femininity as though it is inferiority, when in fact it is only diversity. The perversion of her psychology is clear to be seen. Isn't it interesting that the same society that tries to tell us to celebrate diversity does not want to celebrate the diversity between men and women? Now, people will say, you can't turn back the clock. Yes, you can. They said that about the Latin Mass, and here we are. Wrong they were about that. Wrong they are about this. When they say that about feminist fashions, they're wrong about that. But it begins with you. We need to take a good, honest look about where we are, how we got here and what we are willing to do to go back. Again, I know that this is difficult. I know that you inherited a world where women dressing like men is commonplace and considered acceptable, at least where there is coverage, not the expression of femininity. It's considered to make all that it takes to make something modest. Again, this may be shocking news to some. We must look at the confusion we live in. We can no longer, if it was ever possible, we cannot plead ignorance about the consequences of modern fashions. Just not possible. It's not going to work. I will give you an example from the life of Saint Padre Pio. This saint denied absolution. Denied absolution to a Canadian woman because she sold slacks and pantsuits in her dress shop in Vancouver, in Canada. He commanded her to return home to Canada and dispose of all this stock and not to give any of the items to people who might wear them, and that if she wanted his absolution, she could come back to Italy and receive it only after she had ruthlessly carried out his orders. He told her that he would know if she sought absolution from another confessor. Now she, of course, was shocked. She didn't go to Italy, meet St. Padre Pio, to hear that. But what did she do? Well, this is her business. It's not just her wardrobe. She did exactly what St. Padre Pio told her to do and her life was all the better for it. So where do we go from here? First, I do not expect you to be won over by one sermon, right? Read this book. It's short, it's easy, it's cheap. Read Cardinal Siri's full statement. Read the excellent writings of the popes on this subject. Read the pastoral letter of the American Archbishop Albert Meyer. There's also a very helpful short booklet on Unavoce Buffalo's web, uh, Facebook page. But you must educate yourself. You must be willing to consider that a lot of what you have been taught and grew up thinking was modest, appropriate clothing is in fact not so, and that it's harming society and harming yourself, not helping you. And that you now have a responsibility to investigate this claim. You cannot look at immodesty and gender confusion, which is running rampant in our culture 
and shrug. Say, eh, whatever, nothing I can do. You can't do that, not morally at least. Not if you want to stand upright before God on the last day, when he does not judge you based on what society says is good, based on what society says is acceptable. He judges you based on what the church has told you, and how you have lived your lives in accord with that. So in closing, it is very traditional to have a bonfire for St. John the Baptist on the vigil of his feast day, which happens to be next Sunday. Take this week to consider the matter, to study it, to place it before Our Lady, and consider also how she is dressed in all her apparitions across the centuries and across the different cultures. She catalogs in them, them here. You can imagine how she's dressed. When you are ready, and next Sunday is as good a day as any, take all your heretical books, or at least those in your possession, all your modest clothing that you possess, bathing suits, shorts, gender-confusing styles, and throw them on the fire and don't look back. I guarantee you that you will be glad you did in this life and especially in the next, which is my only desire for you all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.